I've been to Wimborne Dorset. Specifically to see where the band King Crimson was from. And I didn't get there on my own devices. My mother took me there. She knew that I liked King Crimson from the time I was very young. She let me go see them when I was 13 on a school night. She wouldn't have allowed me to see any other band and didn't allow me to see Genesis two nights later. I think the only time she really felt intolerance for my devoteeness was when she came home and I was about 14 years old and found me crying on the couch and asked me why. And I told her that Ken Crimson had broken up. She didn't respect me for that. But I was tagged as a school when I was a child. Ch children, as you know, can be brainwashed. They're vulnerable to misinformation. Now, this was before any of the women or girls who wanted something from me promiscuously had enacted their um, favors. I was still a boy virgin, prepubescent. I didn't understand what was going on when the gang surrounded me and I tried to hide in the church. I was locked out of the church. In other words, they had me pigeonholed, their own choice of words, in a groove to persecute the school of thought that they claimed I emerged from. And locking me out of the church was very symbolic. You see, I've never been married. I've never been allowed to be married because of the martial law underculture in Allegheny County, who stalk me even now, even now that they've ruined my life. Okay. I turned to Robert Fripp of Wimborne Doors that I hitchhiked from Pittsburgh to St. Louis. See, I was partly a St. Louis kid. I spent my summers in St. Louis. I liked the Dallas Cowboys, which was a no-no in Pittsburgh. Anyway, he had this pledge that his aim was freedom, conscience, and truth. Now, anybody who knows what he pulled with his sister realizes that that's the opposite of the truth. But I believed it. I thought he was a sweet, sensitive man when I met him. Their claim that they could tell that I had threatened Leslie with the letter as hocus pocus. At the very, very worst, my letter evoked some of the harrowing decibels of a King Crimson song. It certainly contained no threat, nor did she think I did. She came over to my house afterwards and continued to come and see me at the college dormitory where I went to college long after that summer. And they had people saying, oh, you're not healing correctly. Well, I had a neurological injury. So the idea that the Svengali's could get the truth from the, um, from the um, extrasensory perception of being kingpins in the British rock industry. It allowed an organized pedophile rank to pull off this horrible um, legacy, which was impinged on me. It's a legacy of piracy, of using me as a stereotrope. You're not supposed to believe in innocence. I mean, they, the poachers, you know, they victimize people. They use the system as a puppet show. And you're supposed to go and choose a side between who's innocent gets it. So, um, 
that's the long and short of the stage drama that you have to be aware of when you look at, I just saw uh, Tayyid Erdogan, Erdogan, Turkey, deliver a very sweet um, UN speech for Gaza, which I basically agreed with. The ending was something about what Celine Dion and her command chiefs pulled at the Paris Olympics. Now, what you're supposed to do is choose sides uh, aware of the fundamentalist pro family, or you're one of these devil worshippers. But the truth is that Celine Dion represents the people who claim to be representing the family. But what they do is they set up something that they dare you as a trendy, rebellious trendsetter to identify with an opposition to the moralists who are often turn out to be hypocritical people. When it comes to a lot of things that go on in politics, I'm deaf. I can't just be deaf. I have to do something. I do read things. I tried to come to bat for the children of Gaza. But I try not to pry into things. It's like Anne Rand said in one of her fictions, you know, I'm afraid somebody I like will turn out to be really sick in it. And if you know the history of my brotherly love for King Crimson, you can see why I would not feel that way. And Celine Dion's lyricist was King Crimson's lyricist. So he's um, making sort of a Venus flytrap again, you know, a candle to burn for the moths to go incinerate in. So they make pretend that they're, you know, they lock you out of church and you have to go to the alternative, which is this Pink Flamingos thing from Mick Jagger and Roger Waters. Somebody like me, you know, they have... It, they didn't allow me anything but to be driven into a wedge of what they consider to be the moral of the story of a person who doesn't who gets locked out of church and it's um if you violate the chivalry code you die of their holy war weapon ends on and this was from the mind of the Fab Four, you know, and they think it's really extra slick to be laughing at somebody who was tortured. And this comes from places like Amnesty International. So you really have to identify the active trajectory of the theater principle. It's not an issue of sincerity going on. It's a theater principle that these Romans are relishing um, bringing people to consciousness, bringing them back to God with. And um, they see that the holiness of the world's mission in that regard is being greater than the martyrs who get scattered in the sin world, the sin fields, the sin fields of the sin war, so to speak. And they, 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 you know, the coal people who consider anything a white man, the stereotrope to just betray because it's genetically um, programmed to uh, exploit. Don't look at the evidence. They don't address the organized nature of the Green Party's mission of murdering my father and making a fundamentalist takeover statement. And they play with all of these symbols of equity and intersectionalities without the slightest concern for the fact that the organized crime involved is a rainbow of hate. It's an organized creature of symbolic, it's an arc. Of some that one of one of each, like two of each stereotrope, goes into the celebrity mosaic. Now Erdogan said something about sustainable development goals that leave no one behind. Well, obviously that's very interesting. 
we, but we're leaving hordes of people behind in the way we approach the matters in Gaza. So what I think is um, something Carl, Kurt Vonnegut once said was a little, it's about the 60s, a little left, less love, please, a little more common decency. And I think the same thing sort of holds true in a case like this, a little less bumper sticker. Um, pronounce, pronouncements, a little fewer bumper sticker pronouncements, and a little more ability to adapt to circumstances with the best that you can give it, doing your level best to adapt to your circumstances. And it's clear that the considerations that went into preserving the history of what was done so that it doesn't get lost in time and space, so that people do learn from it and have the ability to apprehend it, was never a consideration for the people who pulled it. What they just wanted to do was get over, get away with it, and make it look like it was a moral story. I mean, locking a child out of church who's terrified, it doesn't show that the child doesn't have moral conscience. And then deafening him so that he can't go to school and learn things doesn't show that he lacks moral aptitude, you see. So their argument is that it does, that locking, someone out of a, locking a child out of a church demonstrates that the child has no moral aptitude. Deafening a child so that he can't finish school demonstrates it has no moral sensitivity. And they swear by that. They swear on a stack of Bibles that they have proven it that way. And it's not true. It's perfectly obviously false. But they have a stereotype. He's white. And that's plays the trump for the whole argument. 